the whole thing about WAN optimization to keep in the back of your heads, we can't fake the speed of light. <laughs> it is what it is. But we can, we can make you think we can. When Rod said we can make a T1 feel like a 10 meg pipe, he's not lying. In fact, it, we can make it feel faster than that in some cases. So bandwidth isn't a bad thing, right? In fact, in these two cases I list right here, if we had an office here and we had an office at the Captain Cook, WAN optimization isn't going to do you any good because there's no latency between those two locations. If on the other hand, you have something in Barrow and you have something here, well then WAN optimization is going to buy you a lot because there's a lot of latency, especially over a satellite link between those two locations. So the short answer is WAN optimization doesn't solve world hunger. What WAN optimization solves is latency. The cool thing about WAN optimization is that the end users notice. It's the most important part of it. When you plug in the technology, instantly they're going to notice you did something. They won't know what, but they'll notice you did something in a good way. When do you want to use it? You've got a WAN with latency, right? Network to your data center. Any WAN will do. This is very important. I get this question all the time. Will it work over frame relay? Yes. ATM? Yes. Why will it work over any WAN? Because our product is not a layer three device. We sit behind your router. The router terminates the WAN. Okay, so we sit behind that router. So whatever type of WAN you have, it's the router's job to terminate it, not mine, if I'm that appliance, okay? So we don't care what type of WAN it is, any WAN will do. And by the way, the further away or the worse the performance is at that remote site, the bigger the effect you're gonna have when you do WAN optimization. If they're saying it takes them 30 minutes to do something today and you put in WAN optimization and it goes down to a minute, now you're starting to understand what I'm talking about. Right? And of course, applications are competing for that limited bandwidth you've got out there. So you got limited bandwidth, far away locations, and lots of applications. How do you deal with it? Right. So I mentioned earlier that the reason we are so um, well respected and we've done so well in the marketplace is that we had no baggage. We actually looked at the problem and decided to take every technique we could and apply it to fixing it. So the first thing we did is what we call data deduplication. And that is removing, in this case, cars from a freeway, but bytes from a wire. So the first thing we do is we remove between 65, this is not a typo, and 95% of the actual bytes from the wire or the WAN, in this case, the satellite. Okay? So, right, like I said earlier, we sit in a unique place in the network, we see all the traffic. Basically, we're a bookend solution. What I mean by a bookend solution is you have an appliance at the data center, and you have appliance at the edge. So here I'm showing a steelhead appliance sitting behind a firewall, behind a router. Remember what I said earlier? Any WAN will do. I just show it as a cloud because it's the router's job to terminate it, not mine, okay? So router goes to the WAN, and then I have some instance either on a, on a laptop running my software or a physical appliance at the other end. So you have to have a steelhead appliance at the sending end and at the receiving end for this to, to play, okay? It's a, it's a uh, bookend solution, as my friends in Canada like to say. But at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want the people in the branch office and mobile workers like me to get the same response time as the users who reside in the data center. That's really the goal, is to make the, this WAN feel like a LAN. In a WAN, you've only got so much bandwidth. By the way, and I'm being generous there, right? I'm showing very skinny pipes, right? I've got customers with 10 gig pipes, okay? You've got chattiness. How you doing? Great, did you get the packet? Yes, I did, send me the next one, thank you. By the way, this is not evil. This is good, this is what guarantees that the data actually gets to where it's supposed to go intact. The challenge is, is that you've got latency. And by the way, I'm being really nice here, I'm only saying 250 milliseconds. I've got customers in addition to some up here that have over 1.2 seconds, 1200 milliseconds of latency. I just did a network for a cruise line and some of their ships have 1.2 seconds all the time of latency where they're going. Right? And by the way, the applications work. So this is the challenge, right? The network, or the applications weren't even thinking about this when they were designed. Now, if you do any reading on our website, there's two different terms for this, and I apologize because I didn't make them up. But the first one is called SDR, Scalable Data Referencing. If you read SDR, that's this, taking bytes from the WAN, okay? You'll also hear it as uh, data streamlining. It's the same thing. Six on one hand, half dozen on the other, okay? By the way, we do this for all TCP traffic. Everything I'm talking about here is for all TCP traffic. The second thing we do is we actually optimize TCP itself. So between this steelhead and this steelhead, we actually use TCP. That guarantees that traffic gets sent correctly to and from, but we use a special flavor of TCP. All right, and I'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so the last thing we do 
is we virtually eliminate the latency for the application. So what I just showed you here were the acknowledgements coming back and forth between the server and the client. What we do is we terminate them at layer seven. So the client at layer seven thinks the steelhead is the server and the server at layer seven thinks the steelhead is the client. We like to say the fastest round trip is the one you never make. Now we're gonna get a little bit deeper under the cover. So the first thing I wanna walk you through is how scalable data referencing works, SDR, data streamlining, whatever you wanna call it. I flipped the picture just to keep everybody awake. I've got a data center on the left. I didn't show the firewalls and the routers because they really don't matter in this. I just show the steelhead that's living in the data center. And these little things here represent the disks, the spinning disks or the solid state disks, depending on the model you buy of the steelhead. So the steelheads have disks in them. Some kind of WAN, the remote site steelhead and its disk, and ultimately the client, okay? So how does the game work? First things first, um, we're not a cache. Uh, caches aren't evil, but I just want to explain the difference real quickly. The reason we don't do caching is we don't want to be responsible for the content, meaning serving the wrong content. The classic use case is medical. I suck down a radiology image. I looked at it, I'm a doctor, I go, great. They've taken another image, I want to see the new one. If I get that image from a cache and the WAN goes down, what do you want me to see as a doctor? Do you want me to get the old one? Or do you want me to get nothing? That's a question that we don't answer at Riverbed. Why? Because we're not a cache. When, what we do is, when a client requests content from the server, we always, 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 always forward that request to the server. So when it does the SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK, for those of you who are technical in the TCP handshake, that always goes from the client to the server. If we were a cache, the SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK would never leave here. That's not what we do. So it's very important to understand that that's a difference. By the way, why do we do this? It's because we want the server to always know that it's talking to the client. We want the server to always send the data. Now, here's the kicker. Whether the data has to traverse the white area is entirely a different story. So let me walk you through it. Client goes to grab a file from the server. Let's say that we just turned on the steelheads. Rod just installed them. They're both up and running. We've never seen any data before. And a client goes up to get a Word document from a server. Okay? Client connects to the server, requests the file. The server sends the file. So he sends the file, and the steelhead on this side intercepts that data. It's literally sitting physically in path. If I were to spread my arms like Big Bird, um, I have one connection that goes to the router, and I have one connection that goes to the LAN switch, okay? And therefore, the traffic has to traverse me. So I, as a steelhead, intercept that data, and what I do is I literally, by the way, I don't know it's a file. This is very important. I just see it's a bunch of bytes in a TCP connection. This is very important. I don't know what it is. I see the bytes come in, and I grab it, and I just start breaking into chunks. I grab 80 bytes here, 100 bytes there, 60 bytes there, 200 bytes here, and I just boom, boom. And that's what I showed you here. I grabbed that file, broke it down into chunks, and wrote it to my disk. It's the first thing I do. After I've written it to my disk, I forward it across the WAN. Now in this case, I've never seen the traffic before, so I have to send every bit, every byte that I saw across the WAN. I've never seen it before. It's brand new to me, it's new data. So that's what I'm showing you here with the blue blocks. So I send it across the WAN, I also send across the WAN a label, 16-byte label. These 16 bytes are a index, if you will, that tells the other steelhead where those bytes that I just sent it lives on me. Why do I do that? Because now that I've sent those bytes across the WAN, I never have to send them again. Okay. The steelhead at the, at the receiving side does the same thing. It takes those bytes, writes them to its disk, and ultimately forwards them to the user. The user has no idea that we are in the picture. So let's just say we sent the file and it's called foo.doc. Great. The user over here, she looks at the file, says, yep, that's great. I'm going to name it foo1.doc, and now I'm going to email it out. Now let's say she grabbed it with uh, a file share. So she grabbed it using, say, SIFS. Came across the SIFS, and now she's going to email it back with Exchange. So she uses her Outlook client, and she sends it back to everybody in the company. When that file hits the steelhead, the steelhead sees a bunch of bytes it's seen before. The only bytes it hasn't seen before is the foo1 name, right? So all it's going to do is forward an integer to this other steelhead, a label file, 16 bytes that says, hey, you've got all those bytes. Serve them up. Oh, and by the way, here's something new for you as well. So even though it came across as SIFs and it went back out as Mappy, we don't have to send those bytes across the wire again because we've seen them before. 
So this is what we do for TCP. Basically, the way TCP works, and I don't have enough time to get into it today, is it does something called slow start, which says, if I've got data to send you, I'm going to start with a very small window. A window is how much can I send you at a time before you say, I got it. So if I had 100 pages, think about me sending you the first paragraph of the first page. I send you the first paragraph of the first page, and I wait to see if you got it. And then you say, yep, I got that. And I go, great. Let me send you two paragraphs. And you go, great. I go, let me send you three paragraphs. You go, great. Good. Four. And you go, nope, I didn't get it. Darn it. And then what I do is I go back and I say, here's one paragraph again. That's how TCP works. It's called slow start. If you were to graph it, it looks just like a sawtooth. If you took a saw and turned it upside down, it's exactly what it looks like. And that's not evil. It's just the way it works. What we do is we don't do that. Our steelheads are smart, and we start out with a very big window. And if we start missing packets because of degradation, we don't back up to square one. We back up very fractionally until we find the optimal place where we can send the most amount of data in a given packet. Okay, so what you do is by making that payload bigger, then we send this optimized, you know, transfer across the WAN where I'm sending labels, new bytes, labels, and you get some pretty incredible efficiencies, up to 98% reduction in round trips. Think about that in a satellite world. It's huge. Um, from a real quick, uh, what do they look like perspective, we've got all sorts of form factors. You've got physical steelheads, you've got virtual steelheads, which is where you can take a steelhead virtualize it and stick it on an ESX host. I, have, I work in the service provider place. We've got lots of people doing this, right? We have a cloud version of the steelhead. Actually, we have two flavors of the cloud steelhead. I don't want to get into too much. But yes, and the difference between the cloud steelhead and the virtual is provisioning dynamically. Amazon Cloud uses steelheads. Rackspace Cloud uses steelheads. There's a bunch of clouds out there that use steelheads today. XTM's Cloud uses steelheads, right? Um, again, all based on the same kernel of Rios, right? Then we have this thing called Steelhead Mobile, which is a version of Rios that lives inside either a Windows or a Mac PC and allows my client, my laptop, to optimize to a Steelhead just like another Steelhead does. The only difference is the data store, the disk where the scalable data reduction happens, is on my disk on my laptop versus being on an appliance. So if Rod and I both had Steelhead Mobile, here's the main difference between an appliance and Steelhead Mobile. Anything I suck down on my laptop is fast for me, but it won't be fast for Rod because he has a different disk than I do, right? Whereas if we had an appliance sitting here and I brought down some data, if Rod went and brought down similar data, he would get great experience because the data is already in the data store. Follow me, it's a shared data store. This is why the appliance is good for groups of people and the mobile client is good for people like me who I'm on the road all the time and my data center is in San Francisco, right? And our corporation thinks that Outlook is a file transfer mechanism. So I get all these 20 meg files all day long. Without Steelhead Mobile, I would just have a horrible life. Right, because what happens if you don't have something like Steelhead Mobile and you get a 20 meg file? You see receiving message one of 35 until you get that 20 meg file and then you'll get the rest of them. I never have to deal with that because I have Steelhead Mobile. And even though they keep sending me all these 20 meg files, there's a lot of redundant data. How many times do you think the word the is in a file? Or a space, or of, or for, or but? You get the idea, right? It doesn't matter which PowerPoint or which PDF it came from. It's the same bytes that are comprised in there. And that's what steelheads do. They don't know if it's a PowerPoint. They don't know if it's an Excel doc. They don't know if it's an image. At scalable data reduction, we just see bytes that look the same.